Good morning everybody, how are you today? Thursday the 22nd of October. My, how the year is flying in some respects. Hope you're doing alright and you've had a wonderful week so far. So as you can see, I haven't really drawn anything. This is going to be a rough base idea. Um, I want to try and see if I can show you a mini video I made um, to talk about aerial perspective. Um, I've just got to see if it will work. Hello, I thought I'd share with you a really important video on the science of light um, and how it affects the landscape. Of, um, for centuries in fact but many artists don't understand light enough to work out what it really means and it's it is important to understand if you paint skies you will be painting light and the way light reacts is not the way that paint reacts so it is really important to get a good basis of understanding so obviously daylight is white light now through a prism white light is broken down into a color spectrum of red orange yellow green blue and violet and white light can also be produced by mixing just three of those spectrum colors in light form so you might have done this experiment in science at school or you might have um, been familiar with it elsewhere where uh, white light passes through a prism and you see the whole rainbow the whole spectrum of rainbow red orange yellow green and blue and violet um, coming out the other end now you've got something called additive mixing with uh, with light and if you project an orange red a green and a violet blue light in equal intensity onto a white screen they actually combine to form white light now anybody in amateur dramatics um, might use these three colored spotlights to form one white spotlight so you might have three lights um, aiming onto someone and they're actually three different colors orange red green and violet blue and they're focusing on there now these three colors are additive primaries now when you deal with the light spectrum it's a different thought process to mixing paints as i say because colors aren't produced in the same way as paint so a blend of orange red and green light actually produces yellow whereas you can't make yellow in paint through mixing because it's a primary color green and violet blue will form cyan again blue is not a color you can make in paint violet blue and orange red make magenta you can make a purple red but you can't make a magenta um, now these byproduct mixes of yellow cyan um, and purple are more of the additive color mixes of the secondaries so if you see the additive color mixing wheel you've got your three primaries the orange red the purple blue and the green and your three secondaries which are cyan yellow and magenta now interestingly in a printer the cyan yellow and magenta are your main colors with black to get what you need but in light they are secondary mixes when you mix other colors of the additive color wheel together so it's really interesting so here we've got the additive complementaries are not the same as pigment mixing which is known as subtractive this is additive so the criteria for additive complementaries is that they form white when mixed together so i'll go through that again when um additive complementaries are mixed together they need to form white light that's how it works because obviously that's the aim with light and it also helps you understand skies a little bit more hopefully this is all making a little bit of sense to you so the correct balance of any two additive complementary colors will mix to form white light or daylight now these are the three additive complementaries green mixed with magenta 
makes white light. So green light and magenta light makes white light. Violet blue light and yellow light makes white light. And orange red light and cyan light makes white light. Now, what's interesting is often in skies, you'll see orange red and cyan or violet blue and yellow. And in between, you do not get greens. So how does this work? Well, we know that orange, red, green and violet, blue form white light. So think about violet, blue and yellow. It's basically the same as mixing uh, violet, blue with orange, red and green as they are the two colours that make yellow in light, not paint. Don't forget, this is all about light. So in mixing colour coloured light, the light is always added. Hence the term additive mixing so you have to totally think in a different way it's nothing to do with paint but if you paint skies it is really relevant so how could it be relevant to the artist and how has it been discovered so if you paint landscapes and you paint skies it is crucial so during a sunrise the sky often changes in color from yellow near the horizon to a blue near the higher regions now, when painting, if we mix these two together in our depiction of a sky, where the yellow meets the blue, we get green. However, in real terms, the sky isn't green. But consider what is being portrayed. Yellow light and blue light. Now, we've discussed that when yellow light and blue light mix, they form complementary additive colours, which create white light. So when you look really closely at an early morning sky, the yellow at the horizon and the blue in the higher reaches, but in between where these two additive colours of light mix, you'll notice a very subtle band of off-white or pale grey, not green. So without an understanding of this really basic fact of light, mistakes can often be made, especially when working from memory or painting in your studios. So understanding other principles of light can help the landscape or realistic artist further. Really important this is um, to understand light. Aerial perspective, which is all about creating depths with zones of colour in a landscape. It's about looking across at a landscape rather than looking down at a landscape. And um, this is how all artists should work in theory. And you'll probably do it without even noticing. And it's all about observation. That's key. Observation is key. So what is aerial perspective? It was actually a term invented by Leonardo da Vinci to produce depth by a variation of colour that imitated the effect of atmosphere on colour in the landscape. So um, obviously da Vinci was a scientist, but didn't really have the full um, grasps or technology to understand why this is happening. He did it all by study and looking at what he sees and noticing how changes and variations happen in the landscape the further away things are. The science bit that we have only really recently discovered is that short wave light is scattered the most by dust and moisture particles. Now that is blue light. So blue wave light is short wave light and that is scattered the most. Long wave light is scattered the least, which is red light. So blue light is scattered the most by dust and moisture. Long wave red light is scattered the least by um, moisture and dust. Now that has a profound effect with not only the landscape, but a lot of things that we talk about. It also explains why the sky is blue. And it explains why things in the distance appear to be veiled by blue. And it also explains the phrase red sky at night, shepherd's delight. Because clearly, if the sky is red, there is least amount of dust and moisture, important moisture in the air. So therefore, the less moisture there is in the air because it's a red sky, the nicer the day will be in the morning. 
So isn't that interesting? Da Vinci found things out by observation that recent science in, in the grand scheme of things has only just really been able to find out. So here you can see a lovely landscape. I think this is the Reekin over Telf Telford. And look at that haze of white light that you can see right at the back in the sky. Then look at the tones of colour. See how it's more blue and purple in the background and more, I don't know, more browns and greys in the foreground um, to get that sense of distance. Now, we haven't got lots of layers here. It's just one big flat land apart from the hill that we're on looking at masses of field systems. But that use of blue light in the background makes it work. Now, if you look at the far left hand side of this picture, you can see that, that those hills are blue they're actually blue and as you come the next layer is sort of more of a yellowy green and then the foreground layer where we're standing the field in which we're standing is actually um, a darker green but look at that distant hill it is purple blue had you ever noticed this before will you always notice it again probably it's absolutely fascinating how it all works and um, here you go is another wonderful example of wonderful distance and depth look how the furthest distant hills are blue purpley bluey gray color but blue nonetheless and each layer that comes into focus from it is a little bit more yellow then a little bit more green and then we've got these browny earth tones um, and grays in the foreground absolutely fascinating um, when you start to look and it's the same wherever you look all over the world um, some some countries of, of warmer climates the uh, the blues are much more noticeable um, here you go it's not just mist that mountain in the background is covered in it's a layer of blue light because it's scattered the most so the sky is blue and the background the real far end is blue and then that mountain that's right in the middle which is still far away is misty but veiled in blue light and it's that blue light that makes it feel further away than these trees in the foreground which are really strong and dominant and bright greens so can you see how the distance works and how this light effect of blue light works now how did the artist use this knowledge in the 17th century Following Leonardo um, da Vinci's example, artists began to organise their paintings into zones of colour, into three zones. So they split their painting into thirds. The top zone was blues, the middle zone was greens and yellows, and the bottom zone was browns and reds. And whenever they painted in a landscape, they always ensured that the zones followed that sequence. So blues, then greens and yellows, then browns and reds every single time without fail and you can see it in many paintings so there you can see the three zones of color now i would say do your sky in more of a cerulean or cobalt or thalo blue then your background has to be more purple based blues which is more ultramarine so that's for your background mountains hills or trees then start adding a bit of lemon yellow in there a cooler yellow right at the back in with the ultramarines to get the green tones then add stronger lemon yellow then start adding more orange based yellows like cadmium yellows then maybe some yellow ochres then your earth tones such as burnt siennas and burnt umbers and then right in the foreground you could start adding uh, crimsons so turner was taught in the royal academy how to use this method and you can see it in all of his paintings in his earlier landscapes such as this in this watercolor you can see how blue he painted the background then he's gone into greens then in that bottom third it's yellows and browns and then right at the front it's more red so he's you know i don't like the terms warm and cool colors but it's sort of cool colors at the back warm colors at the front and it makes a huge difference to um, depth in a landscape. Even if paintings are more abstract landscapes, like Turner used often in his later works, such as this one, um, you can see that the, there is nothing really that tells you it's a landscape as such. 
but his use of light and colour and the understanding that they had, the basic understanding of light and the use of zones, so top zone blues, middle zones greens into yellows, bottom zone browns into reds every single time. So even on an abstract landscape such as this, you know it's a landscape and you can see for miles. Absolutely wonderful to know that this was taught from da Vinci um, in the Renaissance and uh, then taught more severely in the Royal Academy. Here's another Turner landscape. And again, you can see the use of blues in the sky and the top zone in the background of the hills. Then we've got more greens into yellows in the middle zone and the four zone, the front zone is yellows, oranges into browns and reds. Really, Turner was a master at using what Sir Joshua Reynolds taught everybody on aerial perspective. Obviously, aerial perspective was used because the term perspective was always taken already for a linear perspective. So aerial perspective is the depth of landscape, how to create depth and distance in landscape. So here's um, Sunrise at Norham Castle, I think this title is by Turner. And you can see the, the cow at the foreground, which is brown and warm, which brings it forward. Yet the castle itself is in purple blues. And just using that device, obviously, we've got the river that the cow's um, drinking from. Uh, but you've got that great sense of depth because of Turner's severe use of this aerial perspective. Even though we've got a sunrise, there's still more blues in the background, more purples in the land and silhouettes. And then as it comes down, we're getting warmer. Famous, uh, the Fighting Temeraire oil painting by uh, Turner. And again, you can kind of see these devices used here. So even though we've got the, the lovely sunset and then we've got the tugboat bringing in the, the Temeraire, um, you can see right at the back, below the sunrise, below the sun, you've got these purple blue layers. And then as the sea comes forward, there's no greens in this because it's not a landscape, it's a seascape. But we've got more oranges, browns and reds coming towards us, which gives us a huge sense of depth in this landscape. And then if we go back to Leonardo da Vinci, if you look at his backgrounds, you can see how he applied these landscapes himself. You can see in the background, you've got the sky and he wasn't so strict in applying it into thirds because that was the, how the Royal Academy taught. But you've got your blues. Then you've got so you've got your cool tones of your blues and purples in the background hills. Then you've got the addition of some greens. Then as you come forward, you've got more yellows, orange, yellows and then browns. And <clears throat> excuse me, that's what makes da Vinci's work look amazing. That background is subsequential, really, as in the Mona Lisa. You don't ever look at the background. I bet none of you ever really studied it long enough to notice the background. But there again, you've got the blue sky the, the you know, the, the muted skies. But then you've got bluey purples right in the background of the landscape coming into greens, moving into yellows and oranges and down into browns and reds. The painting is all about the figure. However, to get that dramatic sense of landscape and that aerial perspective, that depth that he created, he managed to use this with mastery all by the power of observation. So it's fascinating how by understanding light, you can understand painting and how it works so really i'd go cerulean for the sky or thalo blue or a, a green base blue then ultramarine for the background add slowly adding lemon yellow increasing the amount of lemon yellow adding cadmium yellow as you come further down increasing yellow ochre then start adding burnt sienna then add crimson right the way down in the foreground so by using that list of two four six seven colors as as main colours for your landscape in that order, you will always see depth and um, have a feeling of this aerial perspective that da Vinci started off by observing and that we now have the science to back up. So hopefully you found this really interesting and informative and maybe you'll start using it in your own paintings again. Um, so I'll see you next time. Thank you so much for uh, listening and I hope you enjoyed it.
So, how did you find that? I know it, was, it might seem a bit sciencey, but it's kind of degree level stuff. However, let's get some bird song on. However, it's crucial to understanding painting um, landscapes, especially with these zones of colour. So, what I've done is, as I say, this photograph is just going to be a very, very basic, basic guide. Hello, Marie. Sorry, I'm not ignoring you. Um, a very basic guide, which we'll just use to get the zones of colour in. So you can see I've drawn a background and I've got one, two, three layers of land on top of that. I don't know if you can, can you just about make it out if I turn that off? Let's go a little bit darker so you can see them. Let's go really dark. But it doesn't matter if it doesn't work in the same way. It's just to give us that vague idea of a landscape. But you're right, Marie, it, I think it's really fascinating how light works. Um, and it's a really interesting way to see that it's been going on for such a long time and how it was taught in the Royal Academy. Um, and it's something that gets overlooked. Most artists can't be bothered with it. And then they muddle through, like like the really sciencey bit at the beginning, um, about light and the way that light mixes um which is crucial for sunsets and stuff so the painting that we're going to do is going to be applying that principle in in a landscape so it's we're not going to make the painting difficult because obviously 20 minutes has been gone about me chatting about a presentation uh about it so um i think you'll enjoy it i do so we're going to work with a few colours. I did. I think I put the right colours up this morning. Um, white, cerulean, ultramarine, lemon yellow, cadmium yellow, cadmium red and burnt sienna. Now, I probably won't be using that much cadmium red or that much burnt sienna. But I'd rather have it there so you can see how it looks. But I, I just find it fascinating, and this is why I've been in this game for 20 odd years, because I just find it all so exciting about how to try and capture. We're not going to necessarily try to get the glow of sunburst in the picture, but we want a little bit of, of help, I suppose. So I'm going to go with my flat brush. I'm presuming you've sketched that out now, because um, it's only four lines. We haven't got to draw anything in particular. And I'm going to go with a bit of white at the bottom end of the sky. Now, I've only, I'd only just worked out how to do that video thing. I've not done it before, and it's really, really useful um, to be able to do that. Right, so I'm going to go. Um, that's white on there, and I've just got that much. Can you see? Just a pinhead. The tip of my brush is cerulean because it's quite punchy. So we want the sky to be a cooler blue. Now, in fact, when you look at the sky, and I can't remember if I said this earlier, uh, when you look at the sky, it is always a cooler blue towards the horizon. And the ultramarine bit doesn't often happen until you look way above your head. But if you want to, you so this is just the same, the same blue but with no white really, or this is just that little bit of white on my brush. I've got to give you a warning just in case that um, I am having huge laptop issues um, at the moment, um, which. Uh, imminent hard drive failure um, I've got a new laptop coming but I won't be able to set it up till the weekend I'm just going to give the brush a little bit of a twist so we've got a nice subtle sky we will add some clouds I think so what we're doing today is more about the theory and the practice behind it now I know obviously this is more of a beginnersy group but I think sometimes you have to know the reasons why and the proper things in order to understand painting in general 
Anyway, I can always remember as a child watching Tony Hart. He never, ever once said, don't use a sharp knife. He just said, use a sharp knife, but make sure your mom and dad are nearby and they're supervising you, which was a much better way. So in, in terms of landscape painting, I've just given you a sharp knife in terms of um, a lot of information. And um, I think you're ready for it. I think it's fine. Right, so that is the blue on there. By twisting it around, because it's a flat brush, by twisting it between finger and thumb, it splays the bristles and gives really interesting um, shapes. But I'm going to clean it, because I may not use this brush now for most of the painting. And I'll probably go with a much smaller flat brush and white to do a bit of twisting which will give us some clouds now it really doesn't matter which direction or which angle you do these clouds it's up to you but they kind of look like this in the photograph so I'll do it like this so yes our shop is it's our shop's 10th birthday today Oh, well, that is really interesting, Marie. Have you seen Marie's comment? Yeah. I'd never thought about it for garden design, but that makes so much more sense. If you've got a small garden and you do the same principle in terms of flowers and have more blues and purples at the back and reds and oranges at the front, it makes your garden look bigger. How clever. Hmm. That's really fascinating. Really fascinating. So you can see how the principle then is applied to the, the world of landscapes. As beautifully narrated by myself in that PowerPoint presentation earlier. <coughs> Someone's got to blow my trumpet. And I'm really good at blowing it. I don't want to do tons of clouds, but I do want some. But you can see that this breaks up that that feel. Can you tell me how many people are watching? Three. Hello, three of you. You may have fallen asleep. But honestly, it is useful. And you'll think, oh, well, how does that apply to me? I just want to go on with it. Well, you know, every artist has a choice. And I've, I've discussed this with artists in, in artists' groups. Every artist has a choice. Um, s most are naturally inclined to break rules and just not want to know what rules are. And th th there aren't real rules in painting. However, what I've just shown you this morning is the science of light and landscapes. Now, you could call that a rule because it's a rule of nature. And if you don't apply it, you might find your pan your paintings look flat. Now, in a class, I may, and it may have made you realise in some of the lessons why I choose certain colours in certain orders. And it's generally because of following... Um, the science of nature, the rules of nature, and um, and it works. So you can, you've always got an option not to follow the rules, but as long as you know the rules that you're not following, you're fine. Um, you know, in order to break the rules, you have to know what they are, in my opinion. So it's good to study it so you can go, no, that's not for me. I think this is boring and I just want to shove the colour on where I want to shove the colour on. And that is perfectly acceptable as long as you know why and how the shoving of colour on um, will depend and it will greatly change how that landscape looks. So if you're using much more um, reds and browns in the background, your, your landscape may look very flat. And that may be the effect that you want and that's good, but you still have to apply the rules or break the rules um, in order to to make that conscious decision um, so I'm I'm not um, anti rule breaking I'm anti not bothering to learn the rules 
in order to break them just for the sake of saying I'm an artist, I break the rules. Just my little rant for the morning. <sighs> right, and it happens a lot actually. A lot of artists don't bother to learn the rules and then they inadvertently end up following them um, because they haven't studied them. Right, so I've got my little sky with my twisty clouds. Quite nice. Oh, we are running a competition on our shop's uh, Facebook and Instagram pages at the moment, um, up until Saturday, where if you like the page, like the comment, like the post and tag a friend, you are in with the chance of winning a space on our full day Saturday masterclass online in November, which is a big watercolour class, full day, plus materials sent to you if you're mainland UK um, to use on the day worth 55 pounds um and that's just to celebrate our 10th birthday um so we can share the celebrations with one of you online um in amongst the rest of our class on the 28th of november but of course if you can't make it on the 28th of november you don't have to join live you can watch later right so background hills as i say this this reference image is going to be a very vague idea just to give us some layers um, but you can kind of see the blues in the background the blues and greens and the more vibrant yellows and the slightly more warmer orangey yellows in the foreground um how it applies in that landscape so what i'm going to do is i'm going to i've still got white on my brush because i'm terrible ultramarine and a small amount of lemon so with the background being more blue it could be a mountain it could be trees it could be just hills it doesn't really matter I'm adding a bit more white to this these birds are quite loud this morning aren't they have you thought do you think they're loud? They so they can be picked up on the mic, but they just seem very loud in my little ears. Okay. Very chirpy today. Like that, you haven't seen Mary Poppins, or I can't remember it. There's a scene where um, Mr. Banks is really annoyed and he's in a bad mood, and the birds are just singing outside, and he says, "Shut that infernal racket!" And and the uh, one of the maids goes, open the window, and goes, "Quiet! You're giving the master an headache!" And all the birds just stop chirping. Um, but we like a bit of bird song right I want lots of it's kind of like a would you say that was a teal a duck egg right I want a bit more blue and a bit more white in this I don't want it to be the same colour as the sky Move that out of the way so I don't get any sleeves in it. I was worried that the video would be a bit too sciencey that I just showed you, but actually, you've got to know it. I can't, I can't protect you forever. You have to know the real things, Jackie. That's a beautiful face mask, by the way. Mm -hmm. Jackie's got a very nice sparkly sequined butterfly face mask. Mm -hmm. Um, which is something, to be honest, my mother would be fighting you for the way she's still alive. Because she was obsessed with butterflies. I'm just going to put together... Oh, stop that. the boxes. Oh, I wasn't going to do that right away. Oh, okay. I was going to go and sort out the order that I have to give price. Oh, okay. To okay. To your customer, to give them price. Okay. To put it aside and then come back. Okay bit more white towards the lower part just to make it feel a bit misty I might actually on this area I know well I think it what's really interesting is um, most artists tend to shun science and maths uh, because you know by nature artists are more literary and musical and you know I certainly am however it's that realization that most of art is all about science and maths you know uh, perspective is sort of geometry and very mathematical um, 
colour mixing is all about physics and psychology and obviously what we're doing here is all about science um, in the landscape. I'm going to add a bit more yellow to this blue. Not much. Maybe a little bit of white still. Just to green it up a fraction at the base of this line. It doesn't matter because we're using acrylics. It doesn't matter if we go over a little. But um, I think science is an important application with art. Um, and as I say, it will never hurt your painting or drawing. Um, it will only ever enhance it. Right, so we've got a bit of a gradient there. We've got that bluey teal going into a slightly stronger yellow, green, but still within the realms of blue. We could uh, put glazes on this if we wanted. Um, but again, you don't want you don't want to go too wild with something like this. Keep it, keep it soft and gentle. Because it is in the distance. I've probably made this a bit too big um, <clears throat> to start with. But at least we can go with um, blue with a bit more lemon. So we're still in the lemony phase, but more towards the blue. So even if I wanted to brighten this up a little bit, right at the base, I'll just go with a bit more blue and lemon and no white. Go over where the lines meet a fraction, so that will help us in the long term. I have to say, I'm one of the artists that tended to be scared of science until until I studied it further and more independently. Unfortunately, when you, um, I don't know what it's like now, but I, I hear from a lot of degree level students who, who have just come out the other side of it, that they don't learn a lot about color theory and harmony and, and um, mixes and all of that kind of thing, because it's assumed that you already know, but it's the arts for the last 10 years or more have been suffocated out of the curriculum, you know, with tens of thousands of people each year, fewer people taking the arts as a subject at school because it's not seen as a proper job. Um, however, businesses are now begging for more creative minded people. Um, so we've got a bit of a sad gap where businesses want creative minded people and um, the, the schools haven't been able to teach creativity subjects for properly for quite some time because uh, it's always maths english and science are the dominant core subject which is fine unless you're a non-academic minded person and you're very creative um <clears throat> however um if you took an illustration degree you will get taught a lot more in terms of color theory and um technique than you would if you take a um fashion degree sometimes or a art degree um, because the assumption is there that you already know most of it. Um, so there's a, there's a bit of a deficit in, in, in art education um, and has been for a while. Which is a shame. It's a huge shame. Well, I'm just letting that dry for a sec. So what happens with acrylics, and we're doing really well for time anyway, what happens with acrylics is that um, when a colour is nearly dry and you go in it with some more wet colour, you end up lifting it right the way back to the base paper colour, which in this case is white. <coughs> but you can kind of see, even though we haven't done anything with the foreground, you can see that we've, we've got that change already in distance and depth. Now, <coughs> some artists were trained um, as I said in the, in the presentation that you know the zones of color the top third was blues into greens middle third greens into yellows bottom third yellows into browns and reds now you could in theory paint a graded wash in either watercolor or acrylics of all of that color <coughs> excuse me I've only had one drink this morning 
um, all of that colour down and then let it dry and put your painting on top. That's one way so the underpainting stripes or zones of colour will show through. The other way is what we're doing is where we're just applying more of the specific colours within that zone. So that background we wanted more ultramarine. Now in this zone we're going to add more lemon yellow. In this bit we're going to add more cadmium yellow and in the very bottom stretch we're going to add more browns and reds I think. It's quite exciting. You know I just find the whole aspect of painting exciting and thrilling and I've been painting since I was four or five and teaching for 25 years now and I still get excited teaching this and I don't think I'll ever tire of it because I find it so fascinating how the application of colours in certain order will give us a different look it's just mind-blowing and it's so simple and effective and it's it saddens me that many people aren't aren't willing to be bothered to learn it um when i do color mixing classes for example they're they're, they're the least attended classes that i do yet then the, that's the most important thing in art if you think painting broken down to its basic is the right color in the right shape in the right place that's what painting is and that's how impressionism works even um, and abstract painting works it's all the right color in the right place in the right shape but you need to learn the right colors you need to learn the right places and you need to learn the right shapes um, and once you've done that successfully you'll be able to constantly create new and exciting landscapes because you've got the basic theory behind you so as you'll know, most of you that have, have been to classes with me, I teach technique, not style. Style comes from you, and I want you to become independent artists of your own right. Um, and you need to know the technique. So my aim is to teach technique, not style, unless it's a specific style, like when we do a paint like Monet. Um, but it's to open your world and your mind um, to the different aspects and avenues of creativity so let's go with we'll go with ultramarine and more lemon yellow now so kind of a mushy pea green now with acrylics you may or may not know this already the more yellow you add, the more transparent the colour gets. Unless you're spending an inordinate amount of, of money on artist's quality paint, then um, the yellow will always be transparent. Now I might need a little bit more blue in there. we can add texture if we need to and we'll add trees and stuff um, now they don't necessarily have to follow the same rules it's the it's the effect of the light on the landscape that's important so we can make the trees a lot darker then and they don't have to follow the lemon yellow rule for example or I'll use the word rule. Oops. They can be a much darker colour. But we'll still be using ultramarine to make it. So in that sense we're still following the blue theory. The short wave, long wave, light theory. Well it's not a theory, it's fact. It's fact. Okay. I just, I just, it's so clever how it works. I love it. 
Jackie sometimes looks at me totally gone out that I still get excited by mixing a bit of green paint after all these years. Maybe I should get a cat. Not to replace Jackie, I'm just, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> They won't be very reliable at taking pictures. They won't. They can't tell the time and they won't be able to post things and wrap things um, and serve customers. So, no, I won't be replacing Jackie, but maybe I should just get a cat as a hobby, as, as, a, as a way of not getting excited by mixing green paint. Who knows? So, we'll be assembling the, the dabbler boxes um, for the, any of you that have... have got the subscription box for November. Um, oh, Jackie, can you go and collect my laptop, please? Yeah. My laptop, it's just arrived. Oh, okay. Thank you. I might go a little bit more lemon. Now, don't forget, it's going to be more transparent, but we're just building up a layer there. Now, annoyingly, my paint wasn't quite dry. You know what it's like. We don't need to rush these things. We can keep it nice and nice and mellow. Okay, we'll, we'll worry about trees and stuff later. So if we work on this middle band, I'm going to mix two yellows together. So in theory, it's neither one nor the other. With a bit of blue. Thank you. I think I need a bit more lemon in that. The cadmium yellow is overridden. The lemon. I'm not worried about te texture. For these bits but we will add trees and things after coffee it's almost oh it is yeah we might break for coffee once we've we've done this the whole shop is is just collapsing around me here um i've no idea things are just falling off from places that they shouldn't be falling off from um it's not even halloween it's my mother trying to get that mask off you she did say if she could ever come back to haunt me, she would just for a laugh. Right, so what I might do is actually go a little bit, and I know I'm sort of breaking my own rules here, but if I go a little bit bluer nearer where the, uh, with ultramarine and lemon, it just helps that divide between the two areas. Like that. Giving my brush a clean if you can hear that. But can you see how the light is changing on this as we as we change through the the tones? Now that'll dry enough. I think if we do some trees and things possibly before, because it's only 10 to before coffee break, then we can work on the foreground. But I just want that to dry for a sec.
right key, that means that my fair adapter should be different. Yeah. I'm not going to plug it in at the moment. Mm, not until I've gone. Because there's no way to plug it in at the moment. Okay, well, can you put it back then? Yeah. Alright. Oh, right. Calligraphy the certificates that I've got to do oh, yeah. for it. So I'm gonna need I'm gonna need at least two tables for that. Okay. Right. I'm gonna use the same brush and this time we want to still go with the realms of blue, but I'm gonna go with a lot of blue and a bit of cadmium yellow to make a dark green. Because ultramarine is a purple blue and cadmium yellow is an orange yellow, there is no real vibrant greens in that. So it means that we'll get a dull grey green. Now we could add a little bit of white to it because we're going to push it back a little. But too much white will change the colour altogether. And we can just... Blob a few little lines on the horizon there. Also, scale of 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 trees will give us an, a rough idea of of distance and depth. Now, I don't know if I want lots of trees. I will do something here, even though there isn't really much in the way of trees. As I said, this is going to be a a very loose rendition of, of that painting. So I'm going to mix more blue and green. And maybe create a bit more of a tree. Because it, it's, it's more about the, the theory today than the actual what the scene is and it should it should really help you understand more could do a bit of a bigger tree here that breaks that line Sort of, sort of like that. Now obviously you could, with a smaller brush perhaps, if you wanted to create a further layer up there, if we used more white with this dark blue green mix. And create a few little lines coming down to indicate field systems. Again, none of it's really heavy line work, none of it's dark. Just to give that idea of misty distance. It's quite hard to say fast. Try saying misty distance three times fast. It's a bit like unique. New York. So yeah, the application for this is just wonderful. Look how far we've got. Look how far back that is. Right, so I'm going to go put the kettle on and make me and Jackie a cup of tea now because she deserves it because she's been working hard already this morning. But she's only been here half an hour. Oh, she hasn't been working that hard. Maybe I won't bother making her a cup of tea then. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Right, so we'll have five minutes break and then we'll start just after 11 o'clock and look at the foreground um, textures and techniques. to be professional because they can hear me. So all of the um, plastic acrylic paints I've got out just slightly, there's a few that are out of stock, but um, the blacks, the whites and everything's in on the way today. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's topped the stand up quite nicely. These ends up for me then, so I can press that one. Yeah. And actually, if you, yeah, if you can open the middle pad, so I can stick two one two one sheets, and I can just run them through the system. Okay. Um, oh. So don't let me forget before you go home, I have to do that, I've been cleaning a few classes today.
I am back. This is alright, somebody was wanting a tattoo at the centre of the next floor. I can paint one on, but I cannot. I, I don't think I should be entrusted with a needle with ink in it. You'd have a nice landscape with gradients of cool blues and warm colours to get distance and depth in the scene. Okay, so let's work. That should be fairly dry now. What Now, some of you may have seen that I do this in my landscapes anyway. Um, to a degree and varying, but I'm going to ramp it up a little bit so it looks more um, in keeping with what we're doing today. I'm actually going to block in this foreground with burnt sienna going down into cadmium red. So do you know what I was saying earlier that you can either block in, um, it's more difficult with watercolour, this is easier for acrylics and oils to block in the colour in the thirds, whereas with watercolour it's better to um, use the dominant colours within the mixes. So if I was going to do this in watercolour I would um, be just using more yellows and then add browns afterwards. But with this we can kind of create the earthy undertones. Ooh, sometimes it sounds like I know what I'm talking about, doesn't it? And then I'll put a quote of Mary Poppins in there somewhere and then it all unravels. So I'm adding a bit of cadmium red right at the base to warm things up. It's also why people often tend to put poppies in landscape pictures because the red in the foreground warms up. Oh, I've gone over my board there. It's about time this board had a bit of an extra paint job because it's, it's had the same colours for such a long time. Right, so that needs to dry. Let's give that a brush a clean. I should have done that before I made coffee, but you know, don't matter. Swings and roundabouts. My jar of paint water is extremely beige at the moment. No, I don't mind. We've been getting a lot of um, comments for the shop competition today already. Oh, we had a mention on Banbury FM as well this morning for our birthday. Oh, well, well, I can't see them. Um Let's have a quick look. Loads. Where is this? as well. I'm just waiting for paint to dry you see. But can you see already that although this is heavily exaggerated now because this is solid brown and it isn't going to be brown we're going to put some deeper greens in the foreground. I can't teach you need a donut Jackie and then I'll get sticky that. fingers. Jackie's munching away on a donut there and looking like she's really enjoying it. And then there's me with donutless. See how barren my my art board is of donuts, but I can't eat and paint. And it'd be rude. I do get away with talking on my mouthful a lot of times. Um but really I shouldn't. There is a donut for you. There is a donut. There's a donut for you. I do need to feel bad about you. Yes, don't feel bad. 
although the biscuit supplies could always do with topping up i think at any point so we do accept donations and biscuits <laughs> It has happened over lockdown. I don't know if those of you may have, those of you that have been with us since since lockdown started, I did an appeal for art teachers and the biscuit donation. And I did have a, a decent donation of biscuits for people watching the free lessons during lockdown. Kept me in biscuits and uh, while I was in my, t I am a dunker. I, I find there's a growing number of people that have never dunked. You're missing out. Paint still wet. Must be more. Oh, must be moisture in the air today. I think it's my temperature humidity. That book in the humidity. I'm just going to get the hair dryer on this because there'll be a little bit of noise. I think I got that from the, the health mm. store. Mm. Oh, Florentines. How did that go then for the first time? I make a, a granola flapjack if if I get chance because that's quite a nice quick way of doing it because it's got everything in it, hasn't it? Granola for flapjack. You've got your oats and you've got your raisins and your currants and all of that. Um, I do enjoy a bit of baking and I've just a friend of mine on Facebook gave me a good um, bread recipe uh, for the. Um, bread bread uh, maker that i've got because i never get it to it doesn't rise it, it only goes sort of about three or four inches rather than six to eight inches and i just don't think i'm um, putting enough for yeast in i think old, no the yeast isn't old it's it's just yeah i think i will but when i made that pizza base mm -hmm. i put loads of yeast in and that looked that worked but yes. i don't want it to taste yeasty you know because sometimes that will happen with more yeast won't it mm -hmm. you'll get the rice but it'll taste yeasty mm -hmm. not awful but not great well it's a start at least it wasn't awful to start with you've got a building base there to to work from you've got a good foundation of a florentine foundation to work from now i might switch to a fan brush for this next bit i don't know um, so yeah, it's all about building up layers. If you wanted to get texture, um, a little bit more texture, what I could do here is is go with a bit of a mixture of cadmium and lemon yellow. Cadmium yellow is always less opaque than lemon, by the way, and a bit of a bit more ultramarine. in there because we're going to do this a little bit more with the other i'm just going to splay the bristles a little bit just to give me a little bit of no oh, you see that's too similar a color i thought that was going to be too dark just lightly tap so it's all to do with pressure i don't know if any of you've been following the uh, sky portrait artist of the year now it's wonderfully and i'm so thrilled that it's now on free view um because it's almost been like an amazing thing to be kept secret for how many years has it been going jackie years oh, no. six years because they alternate they do portrait of the year in the winter and landscape artist of the year in the summer springtime and it really is a most wonderful show. And um, last night was really interesting. Um, there was a wonderful portrait done of Trevor MacDonald on black, just with white charcoal. And it was beautiful, really lovely. I'm switching to do a, a more stipple up here with a bit more lemon. Now, how... 
you can see how transparent that lemon is by the way um how you add opacity with lemon is adding a little bit of titanium white it will change the color slightly you could use mixing white um i feel it's not opaque enough when you use mixing white but just a little bit of a stab it changes the texture and makes it very uh, more landscape like I've got a few stripes in there that I didn't notice until it had dried and I'd put the other colors on it's amazing really how when you start adding the depth it changes how the painting looks in 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 many ways um, and it, it highlights things that you may not have noticed before in your own painting um, uh, and what what's also interesting with with the way that my painting setup is is that my cameras also respond to their light sensitive so they should constantly adjust if i turn my lamp on quite full you can see how the light adjusts on here so it keeps fairly constant um so if i get strong areas of contrast occurring um the the camera sort of freaks out a little bit and it misses it off i'm just waiting for bits to dry Hence the waffle. It's got slight bacon going through there. Mm. might switch to a, a good old fan now don't forget when you buy a oh Jackie can you pass me a Georgian fan brush just from the new one please from behind you mm -hmm. just so I can talk about the fan brush for a sec thank you so much so when you buy a fan brush they're very very new obviously um, now this is the the next size up but you can see how perfectly fan shaped that is compared to my old 20 year fan brush but the older it is and the more well loved it is the better it is for grass so that will work for grass but the more you can use a new fan brush the better the effect will be in total Oh, this is exciting lesson today. I'm loving it. And I'm loving the fact that my video works. I hadn't tried that before. So that's another thing that I can learn to do when I set my new laptop up, which is a better spec than this one. And then this laptop I'll still use, obviously, because while it's still alive, it'll be a useful spare laptop. Now, I don't want the paint to be too wet, but I have dampened my fan brush a little. I'm going to go into a lot of um, cadmium yellow. Now, to keep this summery, I'm going to use a little bit of the cerulean blue. Now, obviously, you might think, oh, well, that's that goes against the rules well it doesn't because we're still using a warmer yellow uh, we're using an orange based yellow in here which is the dominant color so it'll be fine but this is what I was saying earlier about learning the rules 
I can explain why I'm using certain things because I know the rules. I don't like saying rules though, even though I've said it like 32 times in the last 30 seconds. Um, it makes it sound so uh, harsh and severe. But guidelines. Oh. Oh, okay. I owe you the money for that then. Well, I still owe you the money for it. Mm. Have I paid you for last week yet? Yeah, yes. Oh, good. Just have to wait a couple of months for next week. <laughs> so I'm just bouncing. I sound like an awful boss, don't I? I sound like I'm just like demand, demand, demand. I'm like a proper bossy diva. Um, but actually, I'm really nice. I always make the tea and coffee. You do. Always. The tea that Jackie doesn't do because ja yeah, the tea that goes cold because I'm making Jackie work so hard that she doesn't actually get time to drink it. But it's there. Um, no, we work very well together. Jackie's worked for me now. We've been friends for a very long time, best mates, and you've worked since 2012. No, it's not time to get a new job, nor is it time for a pay rise. Um, just be happy with what you got. Small, small, th small mercies and blessings. I haven't had a pay rise in ten years. Don't say why you should. Well, you do get a pay rise actually. Every, every time, every time the government forces me to do it. <laughs> Sorry, I'm supposed to make it sound like I'm benevolent, aren't I? And you're worth every penny. You are worth every penny. I wish I could pay you more. And if, if, if you all spent more money online, it would help me to give Jackie the pay rise that she deserves. <laughs> oh, no <laughs> right, I should have gone a little bit darker, I think. But let's let's see how we go with this colour. And then I can add a bit more blue. And then even add some more highlights to it. Because it's a very similar colour, even though it's a different yellow to that mid-ground area. And when you work with a fan brush, you always want a lot more paint than you think. Because even though you're sort of bouncing the colour out, you want it to really... Um, work well. I need more yellow on here. I run out of cadmium yellow. Yeah, that was definitely the wrong um, the wrong shade. So you, you can really see how much paint I'm having to mix. The more paint you mix, the better. Now, when you add cerulean as a paint, you might find it looks a bit too emerald. What you can do is add a little bit of cadmium red to tone it down. I'm going to put highlights on this. I still want some of the, um, the brown to show through because that kind of, if we cover it all up, that defeats the object, doesn't it? We've got a, a humidifier in, in the classroom because it just helps keep the moisture in the air. Just a little. Oh, wrong blue. Just a little one. Um, and we put rosemary essential oil in it, um, which is, is really good for concentration and learning. Um, and it smells nice. So every now and again, I get a nice waft of uh, rosemary. Um on my burner at home, I tend to use um, lavender and rosemary for more relaxing time. That's very nice of you, thank you. It's not pink or anything, it's all glitter on. So I hope not. I only bought it for you, but just mm. sent it to my house. No. I'm going to go with a bit more blue as we get a bit closer. Oh, 
Oh, the birds are here. Let's get the aviary back. We can add highlights to this, so don't worry. I know none of you are actually worried. Right, now that will give us a good basis for sort of highlights and what have you. Now, if I'd have thought about it, I could have put a little pathway through here, um, which I haven't done. So that's nice and dark there maybe a bit more a bit more blue um, I could use a little bit of ultramarine in there as well actually which will make it even darker for the foreground ready for the highlights that we're going to put on there's no particular light source in this um, scene uh, that we're creating. The one in the photograph, it's almost directly <laughs> ahead, isn't it? But I don't really want to do that. Now, I feel it should have a tree or something in the foreground. What do you think, Jackie? Does it need a tree in the foreground, or should I just do some big flowers like it is in the photograph? Trees. Go do trees then. No, yes. no, no. Yes, it, no, like because it. I'm gonna I'm gonna ruin my little the line. The yeah, line. I like it just in flowers. Okay, we'll do that. Fine. that dry for a min. Give my fan brush a little bit of a wash. Doing fine for time, so that's good. Oh, a rabbit would be nice. Yes, I don't know. I could... I, hmm, I'd have to get me Google out. We can get a rabbit right there. Maybe we will. But you, hopefully you can see, because we've got the browns in here and we've gone for the darker greens as well, with the cadmium yellow and, and all of that, we've got a really lovely feeling of distance and depth. There are other things that you can do. I'm really sorry to bother you, Jackie. Yeah. Would you be able to get a small jar of water for me? Yeah. Extra. Yes. Thank you. Because I'm going to add a bit of mist in that background and my water's too dirty. I should have done it earlier on before I went dirty. Oh, another waffle lap. Ra rosemary. It's good to keep the humidity levels in an art room quite high. Um, it stops things from drying out very quickly. You are a star, thank you. Um, what I want to do is I want to put a bit of mist. I get misty. What's that joke? I wanted to paint the fog, but I missed. And I wanted mm. to catch. Ca I wanted to catch the fog, but I missed. Um, M I S T. Right, loads of water clean brush and a bit of white now we can put in a nice haze obviously everything needs to be dry then and this will also coincide with the um, the little presentation I gave at the beginning now if I put a stronger mist on the right hand side so slightly runnier white but not much what that will give us the effect and illusion of is that there's more light coming from 
the right hand side so we can add a bit of shadow or texture or tone to the tree isn't that amazing look at that we've got a nice misty scene now pushes that landscape back but it's still dark if we'd have added the white to that blue hill color it wouldn't it wouldn't look like a dark hill color in the distance it would look like a pale gray hill in the distance and that wouldn't work the glazing glazing is when you use a dilute color a transparent wash of color over another one to affect it um it works better than trying to mix sometimes you can do it for field systems and stuff if you want a plowed field you could do it green and then glaze brown if you want linseed rapeseed oil rapeseed oil uh, flowers in a field you can then add a yellow glaze over or woad a blue glaze so i'm going to go with a liner brush now and do some paler grass which I'm going to do with a lot of cadmium yellow, a little bit of blue, and a lot of white. And when you do um, this, you, you want to make it really, really runny and roll your brush around in. And I know people, when they're getting to grips with acrylics, this is what they struggle with the most because it's hard to get the paint runny enough. What you might find is you need a brush thinner than you've got um, to get thin enough lines because acrylic is a lot thicker than watercolor, for example, when it's re even when it's reduced. Um, that might do just to give me a few lines. Now my grass is still a little bit wet underneath, so it's um, I've got it all over my hand. Look, you can see. Oh, oh that's from when I opened here. Oh, that's lovely. That's from, no, it's from Joy. Oh, that's lovely. I don't think I've actually got a copy of that one. And I never kept a copy of the one from when I first opened ten years ago. And do you know why they got it wrong? They got the wrong date. I had to have two opening days. Mm. Okay. I didn't have the same contacts with the news as I've got now. My mates. Could stick a little rabbit in that little patch there. I don't know whether to do a bit of a fence as well to get scale. That might work. That might, if I mix a bit of blue, uh, ultramarine, and a bit of burnt sienna, a little bit of white. Because we all know how tall a fence is, it's roughly about waist height. So if I have just a few wonky broken bits of fence here. Because you never really want a fence going right the way across. Um, and that's why you see a lot of broken walls and um, broken damaged fences in paintings. It's because um, what happens as, as a real fence stops the, the person from walking through one field into the next. A painted fence is exactly the same and it's, it's, it's amazing just to see how a painted fence can totally change the uh, the view. So I want some light to come 
from the glowy side on the right. I might put, I'm flitting a little bit now, I might just put a little bit of lemon yellow on the right hand side of some of the bigger trees. Just little dabs and dots. And it gives it that feeling that we've got we've got a light source that we haven't had before. Because I hadn't decided where it was. And there you know, the, the so there's subtle things you can do to create a light source. And um when I was giving an art history lecture on Tuesday evening, we were talking about light source and the impression it's hardly ever painted at lunchtime. It was always morning or evening because the lighting was so much better and more atmospheric. Mm -hmm. They had a long lunch. Well, you it could be this. like that. But generally it was to do with the lighting. light bits wherever the light is hitting I really I, I, I honestly am blown away that we're 10 years old today sometimes it feels a lot longer and I think it's aged me 20 years rather than just 10 um, we've had some severe ups and downs here um, but it is lovely quickly google a rabbit <laughs> sitting rabbit oh, yeah marie wants a rabbit oh, okay. just there okay. well that's a lounging rabbit he looks like paint me one of your french girls rabbit i'm not going to paint that oh that might do Right, so let me put that there, just to give me an idea of what he'll look like. Now, if I mix some burnt sienna, cadmium yellow, and white, I want to keep it subtle, so he's there but not there. So I've got like a caramel colour. Restyle, which will never bode well. bit of a creamy white tail slightly pinky inside of his ears and maybe this blue ultramarine burnt sienna brownie grey colour will be good as an outline for him now I've roughly got his shape. My foreground is extremely textured.
I might do a little bit of um, pale colour on there as well, which will be white within that fudge colour just to make an off-white. You don't want it too white because whatever's the lightest colour in the picture will become the focus. That's a pleasure, Marie. Um, and um, we will do some slightly bigger flowers in that foreground as well. always put um, a little bit of pen around this afterwards when it when it dries right so let's look at um, just a few big bigger daisies I probably won't do them as big as they are on the on the screen um, so we want cadmium yellow tiny bit of cadmium red for the centers I might need to add a little bit of white to that to make it more opaque and we'll just put in just a few orange discs obviously wait for your foreground to dry because otherwise I go grey or brown I will make I will use a bit of black pen on him when he's dry just to bring him forward um, right so I've got my white here I'm using a much thinner brush now to give me the petal shapes hopefully you're enjoying today and I know some of you will be watching later or some of you might join in much much later once I've posted the actual image because um, it might sound a bit boring but you should know now with my lessons they can take a turn and be even more boring So if you want it facing upwards, you just do shorter petals at the top, longer petals at the bottom. If you want them facing you, you have them all the same way and length. But usually they'll I'll face. I've got very, I'm having a right game with texture today. I can't seem to stop the texture coming through. It's probably me. I got too excited about making those greens earlier, you see. And that my video worked. This will give you the, this, this gives you an idea anyway, doesn't it? You're not marking me out of ten, I hope. Maybe I'll do a bit of lemon yellow and white. 
get really light versions of green stems but we'll just do it if lemon yellow and white that will just help with our foreground just a tad bring it forward I mean there are lots of things you could do if you wanted to add shadow into it if you wanted a stronger light if we mix because uh, we're doing quite a lot of shadow this afternoon's class which is of the king's men stone circle um, make a purple purple's wonderful for shadows but we do it as a glaze so really runny and you can then sort of add just a little bit from the base of each tree if you wanted longer shadows um, it just adds a little bit of intrigue to a painting Makes it feel a little more realistic. Our little rabbit can be grounded in there. And I can use some of this purple. Within the for immediate foreground. to add a bit of depth and the depth in that will bring things forward as well so as I said that this landscape that I used as a reference I think I even said a very vague reference when I posted it at the time I don't think I'm going to do any more with that the only thing I will do um, when it dries is to um, outline the rabbit a little bit with pen I don't think if I get the hair dryer on it it might it might work now and maybe something maybe a bit of purple on the underside the lower side of each of the uh, yellow centers of the daisies to make them feel like they are coming forward I can show you that with the purple sometimes the fiddly bits are the best bits they, they're often seen as the most stressful and I, I do understand Oh, I've just made him really angry. <laughs> oh no, a little rabbit, what's the matter? There, I've made him a bigger eye now. Oh, these eyes have got a bit of white gel on. There, and I can probably just give him a little bit of a highlight. Gel pens are wonderful. Because if you wanted to extend the feeling of daisies, we can add. You could do this with any any paint. You could do it with acrylics, but since since I've got the gel pen out, I might as well add smaller dots. And again, to get that feeling of depth, you do very tiny dots for distant daisies. Little, almost daisy shapes for mid-ground daisies and then we've got the big daisies in the foreground and of course if you did want to do any poppies in the foreground it would the red would really add should we do some 
a red two three three red poppies and then i'm going to shut up <laughs> no i'm not i never do jackie got so excited then when i said that For all, for all everybody knows, Jackie might not even be here. I could just, she could be like the figment of my imagination. I am here. So we'll do a big red blob and then a banana shape underneath. You have to go odd numbers, you see, with the foreground. So I might do five. You can see how that red has pushed everything forward. I mean, we're really going for it today, aren't we? And what's really fun about this is you can use ultramarine for the centres and they'll look black. There isn't one in that one. But you want a really dark green stem which will be ultramarine and a little bit of cadmium yellow. Nice and runny. I think we will still be doing poppies and things. Anyway. But it's nice to do nice big pieces every now and again. I'm sure, because we're heading into Remembrance, I, I know I've got a few classes that will be poppy related. See, if you wanted to follow the eye through, what you can do is, I'm just going to put slightly darker bits there, you can follow the eye through with a trail of red, so we could have just a few tiny dots of red down by this gate here. So we're looking at the red, following the rabbit, following the red. Um, so you could you could have loads everywhere, but you want to be careful because, as I say, the more red you add, the closer it will come. So if you put too much red in the background or the midground, you'll flatten the distance that we've worked so hard to create this morning. So I'm going to stop there. Next week, by the way, let's just have a look. Next Thursday morning. We're going to do giraffes at sunset in watercolour. So lots of different things to think about and um, and paint. But obviously the whole, the whole exercise of today was to understand distance and zones of colour. So you want greeny blue for the sky, more purple blues for the background, going into greens, going into lemons, going into cadmium yellow, which is an orange yellow, going into browns, going into reds. And if you can always keep that in your mind when you're painting a landscape, you will find that you will always get distance and depth in a scene um, without fail. So thank you so much for joining me today and uh, putting up with my little video presentation that was quite sciencey. Uh, but you'll find it really, really useful. And at least now you know why the phrase Red Sky at Night Shepherd's Delight is true. So thanks ever so much for your company and um, I'm sure I will see you online at some point in the next week, if not next Thursday. Um, lots of classes to look forward to as usual. So thank you very much. Take care and I'll see you all soon and have a great weekend ahead. Bye bye everybody. Bye bye.